Welcome to the next episode of the podcast on negotiation. And today we have a very special guest, Moshe Cohen, uh, who is a physicist who became a negotiator and mediator, uh, who uh, knows how to tame uh, emotions in negotiation, who, uh, who has written um, excellent books about many things, yes, including Collie Wobbles. And that's, that is going to be the topic of our today's, uh, today's talk. Uh, Moshe, great to have you with us. Thank you so much for inviting me there. It's a pleasure. As I mentioned, uh, um, by education, by training, you are a physicist and engineer. Yeah? How did your uh, adventure with negotiation and mediation start? Uh, was there a triggering event? Does it help you, your engineering background, rationality of, uh, of that uh, type of education? Does it help you with negotiation or is it a, a major obstacle? Well, it's, a, it's an interesting question that you asked. So first of all, in terms of how I got there, um, so I worked as an engineer for about 13 years, and at some point I got more interested in the people side of the engineering work than the computers and robot side that I was doing before. So I decided to go to business school and uh, go into management. And in business school, I discovered that I really don't like managing anything. But what I loved was my uh, negotiation class and in general, my organizational behavior classes. So as a result of taking that class, I got some additional training in mediation and then I became a mediator back in 1995 and uh, very quickly realized that if you're going to be a mediator and feed your family, you should do other things as well. So for me, the, the natural thing to do was to uh, teach. So I started teaching negotiation, teaching mediation, and that became the, the bulk of what I was doing you know, since then. Now, in terms of your second question about like whether it helps or hurts to have been uh, an engineer, uh, so I got to tell you, so first of all, in terms of, I was a physics major at Cornell, and after that, nothing scares you. There is nothing in the world that I found as hard as being a physics major at Cornell. So it, it, it prepares you for pretty much anything. But then on top of that, you know, when, when you negotiate, it involves some analytical thinking and the, the sharpness of your analytical thinking that you get from engineering and physics really does help you. Where it hurts you, though, is that very often in engineering, there's a right answer. And in negotiation, because you're dealing with people, there's rarely a right answer. And I work a lot actually with technical companies. And one of the things that we often have to work on is this idea that there's no right answer, that it's all gonna be, it depends. And it's all gonna be, well, we'll see what happens this time because when you're dealing with people, it's not the same thing. That's a great answer, uh, uh, Moshe. And uh, uh, I think two or three weeks ago, we had uh, we had a nice chat with Sherman Rob Roberts, especially on the topic of uh, whether negotiation is art or science. Uh, um, what do you think about it? Is it a collection of of premises and conclusions, you know, derived from uh, derived from science, or do you believe negotiation is uh, is uh, more of an art, or maybe it's both at the same time? What do you think? Yeah, you know, I've heard that question before, and I'm never entirely clear what to, what to do with it. So in the sense of the science being, you know, you do certain things and cert you get certain results, there's some of that. Um, should you have a certain uh, method of preparing for your negotiations? Absolutely, and that's, that's kind of scientific. Is there a game theory element of if we do these certain things, we can expect those, those behaviors in return? Yeah. And that's as far as it goes for me, because the rest is your ability to have a conversation, to understand what's driving the other person, to understand the emotional undercurrents driving people as they uh, negotiate with you, to understand what's going on with yourself, and to be able to steer and move all of that I sometimes liken negotiation and mediation also to driving on ice. You know, science is we hold the wheel, we have control. On ice, we still have control, but we control differently because we have to take the unpredictable into account and we have to adjust much more rapidly on the fly based on what happens in the moment. And I think that's the distinction, that it's, it's more like driving on ice than like driving on dry pavement that you don't have that direct control. You can't predict if I do X, I will get Y. You know, I'm not a chemist, but I understand that if you mix this chemical and that chemical, you get this compound chemical that you know, it's predictable. 
uh, negotiations are like that. But should you know which chemicals you should have at the table? Yeah. Makes sense. Makes sense. Exactly. Even even though although uh, driving on ice is purely physically deterministic, right? Uh, it's hard to predict, and there are some uh, complex systems. And I think negotiations uh, negotiations belong to that category. Belong to the category of complex systems, uh, um, where even knowing the rules, deterministic rules um, that govern those systems, we it's very hard for us to predict the outcomes. I think that's uh, that's uh, um, that's a that's a great summary. Yeah? So let's move on, um, Moshe. Let's move on to your book. Collie wobble. Yes. Uh, when I first saw the title, I thought, hmm, collie wobbles? What the heck is that? Can you help us with this? And I got to tell you, you know, people have told me, like, I shouldn't name it that because no one in the world knows what it means. And they were absolutely right. <laughs> no one in the world knows what it means. But what it means is tummy ache. It means those butterflies you get in your stomach when you're about to do something that makes you anxious or nervous. So, you know, you go to talk to your boss about a raise and all of a sudden you find yourself unable to breathe and your stomach is all tight, that's the collie wobbles. And, uh, you know, you, you, you go to talk to uh, your neighbor about the noise that, you know, their you know, neighbor's making over the fence and it makes you nervous. And if, you know, so, so that's, that, that's why I picked the name. Do you know what the genesis of, uh, uh, genesis of this world is? Where, does, where it comes from? Is it like butterflies? Because you have, you have uh, here butterflies on... Uh on uh, on the cover well the butterflies is because it kind of means butterflies in your stomach but um i actually looked it up and i don't remember the genesis but i know that it's uh, it's old english and and, uh, and scottish so and it's still used i mean you've seen you see it in some popular movies yes Absolutely. So, um, what was the um, how did what was the, the triggering moment for um, uh, for your decision to write this book? Uh, what what inspired you to write it? So, it was a more a gradual process. So, I've been teaching now um, over twenty seven years, and um, I was noticing that we kept teaching people skills and strategies, and then they'd go to use them, and something would get in the way. You know, they'd get excited and they'd, they'd get anxious. They'd rush. You know, some, something would happen between the theory and the execution. And as I worked with my students more and more, I discovered that I had to really work with them on learning how to manage their emotions as they negotiated because that was the missing piece. On top of that, I kind of wrote a self-help book for me in the sense that I always had good skills and strategies, you know, good communication skills, good ability to, to work with people, but my emotions got in the way. I, I get angry or I get excited or I, I rush through things. And I, I realized that something has to happen to allow people to manage their emotions simultaneously with using their negotiation skills because otherwise, what's the point of having the negotiation skills if you're not able to access them when you need them? Mm -hmm. So it, it was the culmination, actually, of many years of teaching and observing my students, observing myself. You know, I also work in a lot of companies. You'd see the same exact thing where people would have great skills, but they just weren't using them. And, uh, and I decided that something needs to happen there. So I started teaching the stuff. And after teaching it for a long time, I decided, you know what? If I don't write this down, someone else will. So then I wrote it down. <laughs> And it still took me seven years to write the book. Seven years? Oh, uh, yeah. Wow. Well, I wrote six chapters. And then one day I looked at them and I said, oh, this is awful. And I threw them all away. And then I waited another few months and I wrote three chapters and threw them all away. And then I waited a few more months and then I wrote one chapter and I was like, oh, this is good. And uh, then after that, over the next year, I wrote another 11 chapters. I wrote the whole book. And then I started showing it to people. I started to showing it first to people in our field. And uh, as a result of that, I had to rewrite six chapters. So it was just this, 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 this arduous journey of writing and rewriting. And, uh, you know, I'm very happy with how it turned out but it was not an easy process to get there. <laughs> it's a great book and I, 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 can, I can safely recommend it to everyone who's watching or listening, uh, listening us. Uh, I'll um, also add, um, add a link to, um, uh, to our, um, our streams uh, um, <clears throat> so that you guys can, uh, can have a look at it. But if you were, uh, if you were to 
to do an elevator pitch, right, for your own book, right, to summarize it to someone who has not read it, and uh, you know, and tell uh, her what it's all about and why she should why she should read it. Uh, what would uh, what would be the key message? So there, there are a few key messages. One of them is slow down. Right. So I really firmly believe that life happens in moments. You could have a great negotiation, and then something happens. And in that moment, you do something you regret. You agree to something you shouldn't have agreed, or you make a concession you didn't want to make, or you say something that offends the other person. So learning to manage the moments is really, really important. And chapter two is all about managing those moments. It's you have this emotional spike. How do you manage it down? So, you know, probably the two words I've told people the most when I've coached them in negotiation are slow down. So that's a key message of the book. Um, another message is to manage your um, longer term emotional responses. So it's all about self-awareness. Be aware of what fears you're bringing into the negotiation. What makes negotiation stressful for you? And in particular, what stories you're telling yourself? What is your narrative about this negotiation? You know, if I'm negotiating with you and I come into the negotiation thinking, well, you know, Remy is so experienced and he's such a great negotiator. I don't stand a chance. Well, I just need that self-fulfilling. And by being aware of what I'm telling myself and the impact on me in terms of the fears that it creates and, and what makes the negotiation stressful, um, that is, you know, that, that allows me to start managing those things. And the third big message is listen. Nothing helps you as much as listening in negotiation. The best negotiators out there are the best listeners. Learning how to ask questions that will draw the other person out slowing down in the listening process, learning to hear the right things, learning to demonstrate empathy and demonstrate understanding of the other person. Um, those are key things. So slow down, be more self-aware and listen. And, and listen. Things, yes. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, the, the, the subtitle of your book uh, is how to negotiate when negotiating makes you nervous. And let's start. Uh, let's start with the 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 premise or the 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 starting point. Yes, uh, negotiating making us nervous. Why is that the case? So it happens for a lot of reasons. Um, you know, first of all, you and I negotiate every day. In fact, everybody listening to us and everybody in the world negotiates every day. The way I define negotiations is negotiations happen anytime you or somebody else need to make a decision. And you don't come to, and you don't are you're not in agreement at the outset, right? If you and I need to make a decision and we don't agree at the start, we have to negotiate to come to an agreement. Like so, for example, who's going to get to use the office, right? Uh, the, the... Exactly, exactly. You know, my wife and I before we're negotiating over who who goes upstairs, who stays downstairs, because we both had to be on uh, on calls at the same time. Um, so some negotiations are formal, most are informal, some are. Some are about money, many aren't about money. And the thing is though, that although we negotiate all the time, people very often don't perceive themselves to be negotiators, right? They think of negotiations as one of those things that negotiators do. So that people think of themselves as serial novices. I don't know about you, but I, I don't buy cars much. I'll buy a car once every five years. Like when my old, old car is about to kind of go belly up, then, you know, it's time to buy a new car, but I'll drive my cars into the ground, which means that every time I go to buy a car, I'm new at it. So perceiving yourself as a serial novice makes people really nervous. Now, one of the things that people associate with negotiations is fear. We have a lot of fears when we uh, go, go to negotiate. And those fears can be broken up into sort of three main components. One is a fear of tangible hurt. Right? If I'm negotiate, if I try to negotiate with my customer, I might lose the customer. If I get a job offer and I try to negotiate for more money, they might rescind the offer. So tangible hurt, something bad might actually happen. Um, the second one is a fear of relationship damage. And I got to tell you, I can't tell you how many people have said to me, I want to ask my boss for a raise, but I'm afraid of damaging the relationship. I, I, people say this to me every week. Now, the actual probability of you damaging your relationship with your boss by asking for a raise is tiny, but our fear of it is enormous, right? Humans are social animals. We want to get along with people. We want people to like us. 
And our fear of damaging relationships is huge. And the third set of fears has to do with uh, emotional pain. Mm -hmm. And negotiations involve rejection. I ask for something, I'll get no. And that hurts people. I ask my boss for an 8% raise and my boss gives me a 2% raise and I feel like, oh, my boss doesn't value me. And that hurts. Or I ask somebody for something and they start to cry. And I'm like, well, stop crying because now, now I don't want to cause pain, right? So if you look at um, you know, human behavior, we try to move away from pain. We try to move away from hurt. And if we associate negotiations with tangible hurt, relationship damage, or emotional pain, that means that having to negotiate will make us really nervous that we're going to encounter those things. Right? And it gets worse because those fears actually get amplified by certain elements. So for example, uncertainty. I mean, we don't like uncertainty. Right? Risk, yeah. Mm -hmm. almost, every, almost every kid in the world is afraid of the dark. Why? Because they can't see what's there. And what we can't see, we can imagine. And we imagine some pretty scary things. <laughs> I, you know, people tell me about their negotiations. They say, well, you know, if I try to negotiate for this, this might happen, or the other person might do that. Or, and it's true, all those things might happen. And that uncertainty makes people really anxious. Um, we also associate negotiation with conflict. Right? And uh, if I ask for this, there'll be conflict. And we associate a lot of negative behaviors with conflict. And that makes us nervous. And negotiations also exist within a power structure. If we perceive the other person to be more powerful, then they might be in a position to actually inflict tangible hurt, relationship damage, or emotional pain on us. And that makes us really fearful and nervous. So those are some of the reasons people are nervous when they negotiate because of all of those associations really trigger their fears. And if you're going into a negotiation thinking of all these scary things, how can you not be nervous? <laughs> so is it our fantasy that makes us nervous? It's our narratives. Narratives. Yeah, it's, it's what we tell ourselves. And chapter six is all about narratives, right? It's called, what's your story? And, you know, we tell ourselves things when we negotiate. We say, oh, you know. So, for example, I run a company of one person, right? And I negotiate with very large corporations. And it's very easy for me to walk in there thinking, I'm just a little guy. They're going to pay a contract to me. I don't have a choice. And if I say that to myself, I've completely reduced my power in that negotiation. True. And yet that's not the only story possible, right? I can rewrite the story. I can say, well, they're talking to me for a reason. Let's find out what that is. Apparently, yes, exactly. So Moshe, um, we talked about um, sources of anxiety and nervousness. Yes, uh, let's talk a little bit about potential consequences. So uh, let's say at some point, you know, we do feel nervous. We do feel anxious in the negotiation context. Uh, um, what risks are we running into when that happens? Well, I think the biggest one happens actually before we even negotiate. And the, the problem is that a lot of the fears, a lot of the nervousness cause people to avoid their negotiations entirely. Right? You know, Wayne Gretzky, famous hockey player, said that you miss every shot you don't take. Yes. We don't take a lot of shots. Right? There are people who have never tried to negotiate their raise. They have never tried to negotiate additional stock options. They have never tried to get a discount on anything they bought. And the reason is because they've told themselves that they can't or they're too scared to try. So I think the, the, the biggest impact actually happens before we even start negotiating. And that's that we don't negotiate at all. Mm -hmm. um, the second, so once we're actually negotiating, one of the things that happens is we start getting uncomfortable and then we rush. Right? If, if you're uncomfortable negotiating, once you're negotiating, what do you want from this negotiation more than anything else? You want it to be over. And if we want something to be over, we start giving away everything. We start you know, speaking too quickly without thinking. And that nervousness really causes us damage. I mean, you've heard about, you know, I'm not sure you know about nervous talking, where we start just talking because we're nervous. And I got to tell you, I, there's so many things I wish I hadn't said. And I said them because I was nervous. So one of the huge impacts is that we start rushing. Um, the, the, another impact is that because we feel unconfident, we don't ask for as much. So if I want a 50% discount, my nervousness might cause me to only ask for a 10% discount. 
And I got to tell you, if I ask for a 10% discount, I'm not getting a 50% discount. For sure. Yes. I'm probably not even getting the 10% discount. Probably, probably. So um, when we feel nervous, uh, Moshe, right? Um, when nervousness kicks in, when anxiety kicks in, is there a is there anything that we can do while at the negotiating table? Let's say we did overcome the fear of negotiating and we didn't avoid it. Uh, we uh, decided to engage in the negotiation process. And all of a sudden, there is this big monster sitting next to us or opposite uh, to us, right? So, uh, that wants something different uh, than we do. Yes? How can we tame our anxiety? So I don't know about taming. You know, you want to manage it. Taming is a big call. That's I don't know if you can, and I don't know if I can tame my own anxieties sometimes. But can I manage them and make them not as significant? That's my goal, right? Mm -hmm. It's like people say, you know, let's let's leave our emotions at the door. I, was like, I, I don't know how to do that. You know, I keep saying stay at the door. They keep coming in. But can I manage them so they're not ri running the show? Yes, that I can do. So he, the first thing I would say is again before you negotiate, prepare. Right, a lot of our anxiety and a lot of our Difficult moments in negotiation happen because of surprises. Somebody asks us a question we don't know how to answer, or some topic comes up that we don't I don't know how, how to address. And the better prepared we are, the the fewer of those surprises we have. Right. So if we're not prepared, we've now created a problem that's going to make things worse for ourselves. And I really encourage people to spend as much time as they need preparing. Look, you don't always have the the luxury of time to do that. But, you know, I'm sure you've seen this as well. It amazes me how often people go into their negotiation without preparing at all. You walk into your office, you see an email from a client, you pick up the phone and kaboom, you're in a negotiation and you haven't prepared at all. You haven't thought about what you're going to say. You haven't looked at your notes from the last conversation. You haven't looked at the data from your work with this client. And all of a sudden the client's making some demands and you're like, ah, and you say yes. And you probably didn't need to say yes because uh, had you prepared, you wouldn't have been there. So prepare, that's the first thing. The second thing is slow down and manage your emotions in real time. Now the emotional response curve really says that anything that happens to us, anything anybody says, anything anybody does, any situation you walk into impacts you first on the emotional level. And emotions hit you very, very hard and very fast, and then they start subsiding, right? That's the amygdala response. Meanwhile, your cognitive brain, your, 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 your neocortex is going to slowly figure out how to uh, deal with the issue. And only when those two curves cross are you once again a rational thinking human being. Up to that point, you're an emotionally overwhelmed person. And anything you say or do in that peak emotional point, you're likely to regret. That's the worst time to make any concessions, to make any commitments, or to do anything significant in your negotiation. So you want to get to the point where you're responsive rather than reactive. And in order to do that, there's three things to think about. One, different people have different triggers that send them into emotional overload. Something that bothers you may not bother me. Something that bothers me may not bother you. Some typical triggers, time pressure. Right? Everybody does well until the deadline, and then we lose it. Uh, subject matter. You start asking me questions I don't know how to answer. It appears that you're much more of an expert than I am. I'm authority figures. I'm fine negotiating with my peer, but now my boss's boss's boss shows up and I'm like, yeah. um, it could be something like certain personalities that I have a hard time with or certain behaviors or surprises. So the better you know yourself, the better you know your triggers, the less triggering they are. So for example, if I know that people yelling and screaming is a trigger for me, I can prepare myself emotionally to deal with some, some yelling and screaming. And then when it happens, it won't trigger me in the same way. Having said that, you're always still going to get triggered. So the next thing you need to do is catch yourself when you've been triggered. And that involves partly being more tuned to your body because some things happen to us when we're triggered. Right? Your, your breathing changes, your muscles tense, your heart rate goes up, you start sweating. Some people tremble. Some people feel it in their stomachs. We know now that's called the collie wobbles. Right? Some people shut down, they can't think straight, they can't, they, they can't speak. Other people start babbling. You need to know what happens to you under stress. And when one of those things happens, it's a signal to stop and then slow down time so you can respond rather than react. Um, how do you slow down time? Well, one thing you can do is just stay silent. If you're not saying anything at all, you're also not saying anything you're going to regret. 
And silence is an enormously powerful tool when you're negotiating. It's powerful for other reasons because it has an impact on the other party. But in this case, it's powerful for you because it's slowing you down. Another thing you can do is call for a break. Let me tell you the words of the successful negotiator. Ready? Thank you. Let me get back to you. Right? I mean, you have to be able to disengage. Other negotiators will put you under so much pressure, and that's when we make mistakes. But if we can say, you know, thank you, let me let me look at this and get back to you. Well, now, now we've gained control of that negotiation and of ourselves. My favorite thing to do to slow down time is instead of responding to the other person, I acknowledge what they've said, and then I turn around and ask them questions to turn the floor back to them. Because while they're talking, I don't have to say anything of my own. And another trick I use is I, I often take notes when I negotiate because I can't write as fast as I talk. And writing things down slows me down. So, you know, I, I, I think all of us have different triggers, different stress symptoms and different techniques that work to help us slow down. Um, the important part is the awareness, the awareness of what causes you to get stressed, what happens to you when you get stressed and what works for you to de-stress. You know, some people are, are really good at managing their breathing. It turns out breathing is a really good thing for this. It happens to be something that doesn't work that much for me. So I use other tools more. So, but you want to develop a repertoire of, of these, these tools for slowing things down. Yes. Do you see, uh, Moshe, do you see any gender differences in triggers and um, slowing things down type of uh, uh, methods uh, between men and women? I find that really hard to generalize. No, I have to say, you know, there are gender differences in, in negotiation. I don't see it as much here. Um, I think I see a lot more individual differences. Um, but no, I haven't, I haven't seen across the board something that I could characterize as all men to do, tend to do this, women more, more that. Not in this area. Not in this area. Yes. So, and uh, some time ago, I, I started using ChatGPT, asking ChatGPT to ask questions to my uh, to my guests. And uh, here's yours. <laughs> I asked ChatGPT what question I should ask. What would be the most important question to ask Moshe Cohen, the author of Collie Wobbles? And here is your question. Can you tell us about the research or personal experiences that inf that informed the book's content? So what were, what was the research and personal experiences that uh, you've gone through that uh, ultimately led to any of what's, what we can read in here? Yeah, so it actually came out initially of um, learning to mediate. So, you know, my, my, as I said, my transition from engineering to uh, the negotiation mediation field was by, by becoming a mediator. And... I had a really hard time with conflict when people would get upset, when people would yell, when people would storm out of the room. It was really hard for me to deal with that as a mediator. So I had to learn how to manage my own emotions. And then very quickly, within a year or two, I started teaching people how to mediate and trying to teach people how to become aware of their own emotions and be, be, be aware of other people's emotions. And the key there was, it was all about effectiveness. If you're not managing the emotions, you're not going to be as effective a mediator. So a lot of the thinking that went into that, um, that started with, with mediation training. Now, the, so, so the, the emotional response curve came, came out of that. And then um, the listening triangle, which is, you know, the, the open-ended questions, stay silent, listen for interests, and reflect back by parroting, paraphrasing, or reframing, which is chapter nine in the book, that became you know, the, the primary tool that I developed to help new mediators learn how to draw out interests from the parties at the mediation table. And very quickly, that, that tool generalized to other negotiations as well. So you know, in terms of research, you know, I'm, I'm not technically speaking a researcher. I'm a mediator and a teacher. However, um, I've worked with thousands of people. And you know, my laboratory is seeing how people behave over and over and over again, and uh, it's those things that were getting in the way. They were, you know, they were unable to manage their emotions. They were unable to manage the other party's emotions. They were blundering around, unaware of what they were telling themselves. They were so focused on getting their points across that they didn't slow down and actually draw out the other party and find out what the other party needs out of the negotiation. And all of those ideas ended up in Colorado's. 
Great. Uh, I still have not read the, the entire book, but I, I about a uh, uh, quarter through uh, through it, and I, I love it, so I can safely recommend it. Uh, we have a few questions from the audience. So here is uh, one uh, about surprises, yes, uh, and the negotiation as an emergent process. Uh, um, what do you think about that? So I think surprises are inevitable in negotiations. I think you know we're, we're dealing with people people are unpredictable. Um, we're, we're essentially always dealing with the unknown. If, if it weren't unknown, it wouldn't be a negotiation. Um, but I would say, you know, I love surprises. You know, you can, you can, uh, you know, buy, buy me a gift anytime and surprise me. But in negotiations, I don't really love them. Because very often surprises means something I wasn't prepared for. And that very often makes me vulnerable in the moment. So you know, yes, it's emergent in the sense that you're learning a lot, but I, I don't want to be surprised. I want to learn. So I, I guess it depends on how you're defining surprises. You know, I learn a lot of surprising things when I negotiate, but as long as they're not sprung on me in a way that causes emotional overload and therefore causes me to do something I regret, then they're fine. Yeah. But the, the kind of surprises that I talk about are the surprises where they somehow um, put you off of your strategy and make it very difficult for you to, to think straight. Yeah, because surprise means um, that um, uh, the reality that we are <clears throat> and that we are witnessing that we're encountering is either better or can be by either better or worse than expected, right? Uh, and if it's better, then uh, then we're happy. If it's worse, if it's worse, then uh, then we might uh, might end up being. Uh, more nervous or anxious yeah and, and about it being an emergent process I, I just want to say you know i very much um think of negotiation as an adventure and i try to teach people to be curious when they're negotiating right you don't know what's going on with the other person you don't know what the opportunities are you don't know what the possibilities are um so in that sense i, I welcome new information i welcome learning and and surprises in that sense but not the other kind. The other kind I don't like very much. The but other kind we don't need. Yes, exactly. Game. <laughs> we have a, another question from the audience about uh, winning uh, a negotiation versus, you know, how do we feel? Uh, what What is the, 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 the feeling or based on what feeling can we recognize that we are winning a negotiation? So, you know, people talk a lot about winning and losing negotiations. I really think that that is a framework that sets you up for feeling bad and it sets up some relationship damage potentially in the process. Um, because if we won and the other person lost, unless this, this is the only time you're gonna see them, in which case you should be as competitive as you can be, um, winning and losing might have some some implications for what happens at that point on. You know, my, my wife and I have been married for 31 years. If we approached our negotiations in a, in a win-lose way, let's just say we probably wouldn't have made it to 31 years. So, um, I think this also happens as part of your preparation ahead of time. You shouldn't take your cues from the other person as to whether you won or lost, right? You should think about ahead of time, what makes this a good outcome for me? And we tend to be very positional in our thinking. So a lot of times my students will tell me, I'm going to ask my boss for a 15% raise. I'm like, excellent. Why not 16? Why not 14? How'd you pick 15? And very often 15 is an arbitrary number. So then ask them, okay, what about 15? is important to you here. And they'll say, well, you know, my boss never thanks me for any of the work I do. I, I want my boss to show some appreciation. And then you ask, so what does appreciation look like? Right? And aside from the extra money, which you certainly deserve, what else is important to you? here? And so if you start moving away from the positional, I want 15% and start understanding what success looks like here, maybe it's not a raise on its own. Maybe it's a raise with a promotion. Maybe it's public recognition within the organization of the great work you've done. Maybe it's assignment to a new project that, that recognizing, recognizes your new abilities. So by defining ahead of time what success looks like, you disconnect success from what the other party is doing. Now, some negotiations also involve a little bit of an adventure in that I don't know what's possible. Right? Maybe I'm negotiating for a discount on a service. I don't know if I can get a 5%, 15%, or 30% discount. 
So the first thing you want to do is do good research and understand what are the expectations from, uh, let's say, the market. Maybe the market says, yeah, it's going to be somewhere between 10 and 20. Well, then the closer you get to 20, the better. However, maybe you only get 15, but you get something else in addition. So that might be good. So I don't think it's about a middle ground at all. And I think, you know, compromise is something that is not negative. It's not, it's not something bad, but it shouldn't be your destination when you're, uh, when you're negotiating. It shouldn't be what you aim for. You know, you should be aiming to try to satisfy as many of the things that you need, as many of your interests going into this negotiation. And if this is a negotiation that you're going to be conducting with someone that you're going to be dealing with over and over again, make sure that their needs are met at least enough so they'll want to keep doing business with you in the future. But it's not about a middle ground. It's about finding creative solutions that solve their problem and solve yours. Exactly. Um, so we are about to, um, we are about to um, um, kick off our negotiation competition for students. Uh, there's another one for professionals. And in general, negotiation competitions is... Uh, um, are synthetic, um, synthetic education, ed educational formats uh, in which a result matters, matters a lot. But at the same time, you know, we can still uh, l learn, uh, learn a lot by making mistakes. Yes. So, so Moshe, if you think about um, all those teams um, that uh, will participate in the negotiation challenge this year, yeah, is there any advice that you could share with them um, that could uh, um, optimize their performance in a, in a competitive, highly competitive context? Yes. Yeah, so first of all, prepare like crazy. If they have an opportunity, I don't know if this, I would yes. say, if they have, if they have the scenario ahead of time, prepare, 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 because, uh, you know, whoever comes in more prepared is going to do better. Secondly, work on those skills. And in particular, the, the listening skills, in particular, some emotional management skills and general communication skills, and then practice. Practice, 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 practice on each other, practice on their friends. Um, so when they finally come into the competition, they're, they're in a good place. And during the competition, more than anything else, slow down. Slow down. Slow Try down. Be reactive. Try to listen really carefully to what you're hearing. Try to think about what kind of questions you can ask that will move the process forward. Spend more time listening than talking. Um, you know, I've gotten into trouble by, because I've talked. I've never gotten into trouble because I've listened and use what you've heard to move the process forward. That's a great set of tips, uh, Moshe. Uh, I have one last question, and it's always the same for every single guest of mine, and that is um, a question about great negotiators or mediators. You can choose mediators if you wish. Yes. Uh, anyone comes to your mind, uh, Moshe, when, uh, when you hear this question? Well, you know, I always have a hard time with these questions because there are a lot of great negotiators out there and most of them have flown under the radar. You know, my grandmother was a great negotiator, but chances are you haven't heard of her, right? So, so I, 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 and the great negotiators that we often put out there is, oh yeah, this person was a great negotiator. We know what they achieved, but we actually don't know what they did. So I don't know if they got lucky. I don't know if the other person was just a really bad negotiator. So, um, but some people come to mind, Roger Fisher, you know, one of the authors of Getting to Yes, and really one of the people who started the, the Harvard program of negotiations um, had such a huge impact on the field and achieved a lot, both as a practitioner and as an academic. Um, so certainly one of my heroes in the negotiation field. And, but there's other people that you can see the results that they, that they had, you know, people like George Mitchell and, and the Good Friday Agreements and that kind of thing. But again, I wasn't in the room. I don't know what he did as a negotiator to be able to say whether he was a great negotiator or not. Moshe, I know. Thank you so much for sharing this. Uh, I know you're working on three books. Could you tell us a little bit more about it, if, if, if possible, so that we can raise a little bit expectations in, uh, in, in, among our audience? So, so first of all, aside from Kali Wobbles, I have uh, two books of essays that are already out there. One of them is actually out there already. It's called, the, it's called Optimism is a Choice. The other one is in the editing process, will be out so soon. It's called The Optimistic Pessimist. But aside from that, I'm writing three books, um, one on listening, sort of taking chapter nine in uh, Kali Wobbles, but really expanding it and applying it to context other than negotiation as well. Um, one on leadership, and it's sort of an anxiety-related um, look at leadership 
because a lot of times people who go into leadership positions are pretty anxious at the outset. And then the third one is about narrative. And again, it's like taking chapter six, but expanding it way beyond negotiation. And the idea behind narrative is that the stories we tell ourselves have a huge impact on how we feel, what we do, and how we interact with other people. And if we learn to recognize and manage our narratives, we can learn to manage our lives. Thank you so much uh, for sharing these. I'm uh, very excited, uh, <clears throat> very excited to read also those books that are coming up. And when, uh, when more or less, uh, can we start uh, searching for your new books? So the new, um, the, the optimistic pessimist should be out in a couple months, um, and the others, you know, probably more like a year. So, so we, more like we've, a got year. Some, we've got some work to do on this. All right, Moshe, thank you so much for sharing your tips, your um, your recommendations. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us. Uh, it's been uh, it was a great pleasure to have you with us. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you for ah. And by the way, uh, to our listeners and viewers. This is a very, very good book, Collie Wobbles. If you guys have problems with nervousness and anxiety in negotiation, that's what you should read. Thank you so much. It was great to have you with us. Thank you, Remy, for inviting me. Thank you, everybody, for listening. And uh, it was a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.